specializes in energy modeling and certification design support for passive house projects in New York City. She coordinates uh, with multidisciplinary teams on high performance projects with the latest cutting edge technology in the industry. Her design guidance on the envelope and mechanical systems is integral to project planning and implementation throughout design and construction. Her experience in Passive House includes all electric buildings, carbon neutral ready community developments, multifamily new construction, mixed use and affordable housing. And Vicki also serves on the board of directors at New York Passive House, where she focuses on inclusion, equity, and diversity initiatives. So with that, I think we're ready. Um, Vicki, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thanks so much for the intro. Um, and thanks for having me on. Happy to be here uh, just to share my own experiences and some really cool work that we've been doing at CEO Winters. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a Passive House consultant at Stephen Winters. I'm uh, based in New York City and uh, for today, I'll go through just, yeah, background, some uh, experiences in past house project highlights, and um, interesting updates on PTHPs and how they can be incorporated in past house projects. So just on my own background, um, yeah, I learned a lot about sustainable built environments during my time in college. Um, I think that's, yeah, definitely when I first started getting into um, learning about the built environment uh, and just learning how much um, vast majority of emissions come from our built environment, how much they can impact our day-to-day -day lives and uh, just really cool work in uh, sustainable buildings, sustainable development and making impacts on a systematic level. Uh, and I learned a lot about Passive House, especially during my time at Stephen Winters and on New York Passive House. Um, when I first learned about Passive House and all the benefits in terms of uh, creating a low energy building, all the cost savings, how it, how it uh, provides a healthy and comfortable environment for occupants, I was just like, well, why build any other way? Um, <laughs> and there's definitely so many, um, I feel like exciting updates and news about how we can push the envelope further just all the time. Um, like around the time that I started at Seaton Winters, it was after Cornell Tech was built. So um, the world's tallest passive house. And now later on, I'll also be talking about PTHPs. So yeah, definitely very exciting. And that's definitely what drew me to passive house from the beginning. Um, and as mentioned before, I'm also on New York Passive House, uh, which is a nonprofit. It's focused on uh, collaborative advocacy, education and resources on Passive House. And um, as mentioned before, I focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, initiatives there. Uh, just also, also focusing on their mission of extending education resources to all. Yeah, and during my time as a consultant in Passive House, I feel like I've put on a number of different hats. So as a consultant during my day to day, um, it varies from providing air barrier views and providing comments back to architects on how to improve their details. So yeah, really focusing on continuous uh, air barrier strategies and mitigating thermal bridges. Uh, on top of that, also providing MEP plan reviews and evaluating um, their ventilation systems, their efficiencies, that everything is looking good. Um, and uh, as well as looking at thermal analyses. So thermal bridge analysis here, for example, parapet or other key junctions around the building or key penetrations around the building. And interestingly too, we have uh, a number of projects, either multiple buildings with the same developer or a uh, development where we're evaluating more than one building at a time. So for example, here I have a couple of 3D models um, showing an example of that, where we evaluated two buildings during design simultaneously, and also learning more about how project specific or building specific uh, number of projects can be. Um, so yeah, interesting work here. And also just some key project highlights. Um, as you probably know, Passive House is a bit of a misnomer. It's, it's uh, definitely applicable to many different typologies, whether it's commercial, mixed use, market rate. Um, 
in my own project experience, um, most recently it happens to be a lot of affordable housing projects in New York City. So just a couple of examples here. Uh, we have Bronx Pro Development, uh, where they're a developer that focuses on expanding access to affordable housing that's also sustainable and replica replicable. So we had three projects uh, nearly back to back or simultaneous with Bronx Pro. So this is uh, 4697 Third Ave, Mapes Avenue and Melrose North. Um, and on the other side, we have a number of Vital Brooklyn projects. So Vital Brooklyn is an initiative in New York focused on community development programs for underserved neighborhoods in central Brooklyn. So they offer a um, yeah, very interesting holistic approach uh, focusing on a number of issues like economic empowerment, sustainability, um, providing affordable housing. So we have a number of different building projects involved in the Vital Brooklyn project where they're affordable and all electric. And they also have very interesting uses in the building that address occupants other needs for social services and the like. Um, and one of these is also called Clarkson Estates, um, which features PTHPs. And that's my segue to what a lot of you are tuned in for, which is, yeah, uh, this growing interest in PTHPs, how we can incorporate them into passive house projects and, and so on. So uh, in this discussion, I'll first start off by explaining what are PTHPs. Um, that's a good place to start. So uh, yeah, what is a PTHP? It stands for Package Terminal Heat Pumps. So packaged as in off the rack, terminal as in it's an isolated unit and a heat pump, which is its function here. So yeah, it's a useful technology. It provides both heating and cooling. And we've been seeing it as a viable and emerging, emerging technology for achieving low energy buildings uh, based on um, a lot of interesting improvements we've been seeing in the industry here. And so with PTHPs, there's a number of advantages and disadvantages. Um, overall, we see PTHPs aligning well with how the industry is moving, which is really towards electrification and decarbonization. So a lot of its features, as in it being all electric, it being compact and efficient, um, yeah, it makes it a very uh, favorable option for this. And so I'll walk through just a few of these uh, key advantages. And also in my presentation, I'll talk specifically about um, ICER as an example PTHP. Um, I don't represent them in any way, uh, but um, yeah, just for simplicity's sake, uh, I'll be going through just one example, but our team has also been looking at other PTHP options as well. So yeah, one uh, key advantage off the bat is PTHP's low first cost. So our studies have shown then we found that PTHP units are more affordable than VRF. So we compared a VRF system to an ICE Air PTHP system for a 35 story, 348 unit building. And we found that it cost savings is uh, $6.60 per square foot, less than VRF without heat recovery. So in total, that amounts to two million, about $2 million. And the savings would be even greater if compared to VRF with, recover with heat recovery. Another key benefit is that uh, PTHPs provide simultaneous heating and cooling for the building and also personalized room by room control and comfort. Um, so this is better occupant comfort with adjustable set points and switching the option between heating and cooling mode. So not only do you have a lot of control per apartment, um, but also even by room. And another great benefit is that if one unit breaks down, the other units can keep working. And another benefit is it's simple metering, which benefits both the owner and tenant immensely. So, um, we found that with some VRF systems, they require a complex third-party metering system that bills tenants for cooling and then isolates the energy used for heating and cooling by individual apartment. So this is, leads to a very confusing 
yeah, bill for tenants where they see one electric bill from the utility provider and then this separate bill from a third party uh, that just shows cost for cooling. So there have been instances where tenants don't end up paying their cooling bills and then owners are left footing the bill for cooling, um, which definitely adds up when there's so many apartments in their buildings. Um, in contrast, PTHPs can offer a very simple way to isolate the energy used for heating and cooling. So for example, with ice air, um, in cooling mode, the electricity is on the tenant panel and in heating mode, the electricity is on the house panel. And they have a relay switch that's triggered um, that allows it to switch. So this eliminates the need for an additional control layer and third party billing system that's required by most VRF systems. So yeah, in all, it, it simplifies the process really for both ends for the owner and the tenant. And then next I'll go into um, SWA's analysis in terms of how the PTHPs perform for air tightness and thermal performance. So yeah, we at SWA, we tested the units, uh, first the initial unit to gauge um, initial air leakage results, and then a second improved unit uh, by having all the penetrations fully sealed off. So these improvements included factory sealing all sheet metal seams, junctions, and screw holes on the sleeve, tightly sealing the perimeter weather stripping between the sleeve and PTHP when the PTHP is installed, uh, sealing off for eliminating additional knockouts, filling P-traps with water, fully sealing refrigerant line penetrations, and electrical wiring. Um, so in all, by making all these improvements, it significantly reduced the air leakage at these PTHP units. And these improvements are being incorporated into the production and manufacturing process by ICE Air. So taking those improved air leakage results, we then um, analyzed what the expected performance would be um, uh, provided these improved PTHP leakage results. So we looked at the stats of a few completed past house projects. Um, so we looked at about eight completed projects and uh, looked at their final blow door numbers, what their energy demands were, and then looked at hypothetically, if these projects had PTHPs, uh, what would those impacts be? So we took the leakage numbers and scaled them up, uh, assuming, assuming that every bedroom and living room would have that PTHP. So we saw overall there was really small movement in all these indicators here. Um, for the predicted blower door, we saw about a 2% increase in the expected forward or test result um, and about less than 1% increase for the primary energy demand and for the heating demand. And then with air leakage looking acceptable, we also evaluated um, the expected thermal bridging performance uh, through the PTHP sleeve and the penetration. So ICER is currently developing an improved version with better thermal performance. So it's improved by having a continuous spray applied insulation layer between the interior and exterior side, which is represented in the yellow here. And through our heat three modeling results, um, we, we uh, calculated an effective R value and point thermal bridge chi value that then you could use in a passive house model. And so in one case, uh, we evaluated the thermal performance of a PTHP modeled without the sleeve. So we found that that was about R3.15. And then case two is the PTHP model with, with the sleeve. Um, and we found that the R value decreases to about 2.57. Um, so with the continuous sheet metal housing on the PTHP unit and without a thermal break, um, it does undermine the thermal performance of the unit, um, but still the R value of the PTHP is pretty good and they are working to improve it still. And so evaluating those factors there, um, how does this tie into FIAS and PHI certification and testing? Um, with FIAS, um, they already established uh, two different blower door test methods, A and B. So yeah, this is to provide some context on how exactly do they evaluate air tightness overall. Um, they have method A, which is known as the untaped test. And this is your normal whole, blower, whole building blower door test, uh, where you initially check if it meets, if your building meets a standard target. So for FIAS, it's 
0 0.08 CFM per square foot of envelope area at 50 pascals. Um, so if you perform your whole building border test and it's under that target, then you pass right away. Um, if it happens to be greater than that limit, uh, FIAS allows you to perform an additional tape test uh, where you can close or seal off any intentional openings in the building and the otherwise known as non-threatening sources of leakage. So such as dampers and elevator doors, um, those are allowed to be taped off. Um, so then you have your untaped test result that can go into your passive house model, um, which yeah, would be, could be higher. Um, and then your taped result that proves, you can use that to prove that your building is designed to be airtight and that it is passing that standard airtightness target. So how does that tie in with PTHPs? Um, yeah, we discussed PTHPs with FIAS and they recognize that it's uh, yeah, definitely a, a favorable uh, mechanical system that uh, building owners are interested in. Um, and we, they've established that PTHP sleeves can be defined as non-threatening air leakage locations. So as following typical FIAS protocol, um, yeah, you can perform an untaped test. Um, and if it's higher than their original standard target that they aim for, um, you can perform a tape test and you can tape off these PTHPs and they're considered as non-threatening sources of leakage. And by taping off the PTHPs, you nearly eliminate the risk of failing the road or test. And with PHI, um, we've also brought up PTHPs with PHI. Um, and we presented our findings to them and they also recognized its potential and being um, a technology that can be used on pass fails projects. So in response, PHI developed a new PHI pilot program. Um, so this applies to one PTHP pass fails project for a developer and any project starting before December 31st of this year. Um, so Similarly, if the first board or test exceeds the target, in this case, PHI's target of 0.6 ACH50, um, you can use a second board or test, which is taped, to prove that it can meet the design criteria. Um, the main difference here is that with the untaped test, your first initial test, it should still be less than 0.8 ACH50. Um, and then again, your second board or test should be less than 0.6 ACH50. Um, for later projects, they'll, their plan right now is that they'll go back to the 0.6 ACH 50 requirement and by then reliably air test, airtight PTHP should be available. So in summary, uh, PTHPs are an emerging technology. Uh, they're compact, efficient, and versatile. We see a lot of benefits from using it, such as its pathway to electrification and fuel switching, its low installation costs, its also have less refrigerant leakage than other systems such as DRF systems. And as PTHPs continue to improve, we anticipate more adoption in passive house ahead. So thanks, um, open for any questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vicki. That was a lot of um, really juicy details. Um, in a short amount of time. Uh, <laughs> I think also this is this is really excited, exciting for any of us who um, you know have had to battle um, the PTAC discussion basically or PTHP discussion in the past. Um, since I uh, was formerly a, a passive house consultant um, in New York, that was something that was you know difficult to do because everybody wants to use, PTHPs, um, and we had to kind of steer them away from it, but it sounds like we might be coming to a point where that's not necessarily the case, even if, you know, we have to be um, still somewhat careful. Um, and, you know, your your data on this, um, basically just, it helps us move forward with, um, with doing these things that are friendly to the industry. So thank you for that. Um, before we get into questions, which we do have a lot of everyone is excited. Um, we're gonna pass it off to Kim for a message from our sponsors. Hi, I'd like to give a big thank you to the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. First, a big shout out to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA. 
the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you, too, to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel, Minotaur, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thank you to our champion sponsors, Bewiso, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, Prosico, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Brennan Brennan, Coltraco Ultrasonics, Euroline Windows, Holstrom System, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and U.S. Engineered Wood T-Stud. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, Zach. It feels like you're right here with us. Um, so uh, we are going to pull up a quick poll as we get our question deck um, uh, ready. And I think um, we're going to start with, let's see, Andrew Peel, you had like three really great questions. I don't know if you want to start with one and unmute yourself um, or... Oh, yeah. Okay. So first one, uh, the operational. So um, this is, I mean, I'm in Canada. It's always a contentious issue with cold climate performance. Uh, so I was just wondering, is um, uh, is there any operational data from these units that they actually perform well? Because we, we know um, certain systems, they might look good on paper, but uh, you know, when they get installed and they're actually operating and they got all the defrost cycle and stuff, they end up not performing well. So I was wondering if there's any uh, data on that. Um, and then the, the other two questions, one was, uh, were the, was the casing of the improved um, uh, unit insulated fully? Um, and then this third question was, if you have any uh, taped and untaped test from an actual uh, building. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Um, your first part of the question on ter in terms of performance. Um, yeah, so far we mostly have data from the manufacturer on how these are intended to perform. So they have good COPs even at sub-freezing temperatures. Um, I, I'd have to pull up, but I think up until like negative 20 degrees Celsius, we even have those COPs of at least one. Um, so far our projects are are either in design or feasibility or just about starting construction. So we, for our passive house PTHP projects, at least we don't have extended data quite yet on that. No, that's great. And then the, the <laughs> third one's the uh, insulation of the casing of the, uh, um, of the heat pump unit itself. Got it. Yeah, so we have, yeah, it's insulated um, with a continuous spray, spray applied insulation. Um, yeah, uh, just between the interior and exterior. Between the interior and exterior. Oh. Um, um, at the PTHP in the wall, um, I could pull up the slide back. Uh, just where it's kind of, um, so yeah, so not the entire case. Okay, so is that like where it's going through the um, the building envelope, or um... right? So where, yeah, where it's going through the building envelope, where it's going through the building envelope. Okay, so the unit itself um, is not, um, at least the one you're working with, is not insulated. Or yeah, so yeah, the improved unit would be insulated. The, the, so the oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry, okay, <laughs> I think I sorry. The question. The, so the so basic you, unit is not insulated in any way. Right. The improved unit is insulated at the connection with the building envelope, and then right. uh, yeah, and then the but the unit itself um, is not like the casing of the unit itself is not insulated. Sorry, I think I misunderstood your question at first, but yeah, the current PTHP units they don't have insulation. And the improved units, they do have insulation with, inside the casing. Inside the casing. Okay. Yeah. Good. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Good. Thank you. Good technical questions. And just going off of that, um, what kind of improvements might we see um, or do you expect in the 
in the PTHP sleeve, because you were kind of alluding to that there might be improvements in the future. Right. So, yeah, so far, um, ICER has been incorporating our air tightness improvements, like our recommendations for minimizing air leakage, um, and also improving it thermally by including more of the insulation. Um, it might also include a thermal break potentially, which would further increase that R value and mitigate that thermal bridging. I'm going to selfishly ask one more part of his question, which I, I don't know that um, we got answered, which is if you had test data between the taped and untaped, like what is the damage of not improving the air tightness of the unit? Do we, do you have that data? Uh, if it wasn't, in, if it wasn't improved. Um, right. I think so it, did you do yeah. it before and after test, I guess? Yeah. I mean, it would still, it's still possible. Um, but I mean, of course we still want to reduce as much leakage as possible. Um, um, but I definitely being able to have that second blower door test where you can tape off the units is, was definitely a big game changer. Like it definitely makes it more possible for these products to be certified. So that's why. Um, we brought this up to PHI just to confirm if they'd be willing to allow a second blower door test, you know, just in case projects can't get right under that 0.6 ACH50 number. Um, so because they are allowing this in their pilot program, that does help make, make it possible. Right on. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll get back to our um, question queue. I think uh, Ken Neuhauser... Looks like you came on. There you are. Sure. All right. Thanks, Carmen. Um, so, uh, Vicky, question about uh, SWA's analysis. Um, you, you noted the comparison in, in cost and also um, on the operational side. Does that does the analysis uh, or how does it account for the the thermal network impact? Where like a VRF with heat recovery system or water source heat pump can can move waste heat from one zone to a, a zone that needs heat. And obviously we, we can't do that with these kind of systems. So did you find that have an impact in the operational performance? Yeah, so we we really just uh, mostly analyzed the first initial costs of between the two systems. Um, operationally, I mean, VRF systems and PT PTHPs have comparable COPs. So I would think that they would also have comparable costs there. Um, but I, you know, hopefully we can get more data as more projects um, install these PTHP units. Okay. Yeah, I was hoping somebody cracked the code and found a way to, <laughs> to model that, that thermal network benefit, but apparently not yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And it looks like um, the next question, let's bring on, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this, but Seon Hee Kim, you can correct me. If you're not able to unmute, we can ask your question for you. Um, the question was, does PTHP account slash meet ventilation requirements or should it be used in conjunction with a DOAS system? Does it meet ventilation requirements? I guess uh, can ventilation be incorporated into these? Yeah, I think I understand like because the APACA has an option where it's like it's a PTHP but also functioning as an ERV. Um, so we have a couple of projects asking about that because they might be interested. Um, but so far, you know, we'd have to work with the MEP on, like our main concern is like how the bathrooms and kitchens would still be directly exhausted because that's what we do on pass pass projects. So having an ERV, yeah, as the PTHPs, that, that's like a complication you would have to work out with the MEP. So it'd still have to solve for the local exhaust. Um, but, and this is related to, I believe it was Christy Love's question of whether ICE Air has a HRV integrated product. And we'll shout out um, 
one of our sponsors and friends, uh, Minot Air, has cracked that code. <laughs> At least they have an integrated um, uh, heat pump, package terminal heat pump with uh, with ERV, HRV options. And as Vicky mentioned, um, the POCA units also now have a an ERV integrated option. But it doesn't solve the local exhaust issue, which is yeah. still an issue. Yeah. Um, okay. I I lost track of our list. Zoe, do you know who's next? Yeah. Chris S. Do you want to go ahead and unmute? Uh, hi, thanks. Great presentation. And I think you answered my question that COPs are equivalent, um, unless there's something hiding in maintenance over you know, a longer time frame with that $2 million example of savings, um, you know, hold, hold true over a longer time period. So I guess I'd ask a second question. If um, you've seen any evolution for these uh, products in regards to refrigerants, is anybody using, you know, CO2 or propane, for example? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about how you know, what exact refrigerant they use. Um, I think that, at least for ice air, that holds 1.2 kilograms of R410A refrigerant. Um, not sure about other types of refrigerant that's available for them. Um, and of course, overall, it uses less refrigerant than VRF systems and will cause less problems if, in, if there was an instance of a leak. Um, not sure. Uh, does that answer your question enough? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, refrigerant is such an interesting question with this, I think, because it's kind of that amount of refrigerant and potential for leakage versus, you know, the type of refrigerant. So that's an interesting kind of life cycle assessment question um, that might be interesting uh, think about for the future, too. Yeah, we have some information coming in. Thanks, John Foster, um, saying that Epoca in the U.S. uses R410A, but in Italy they are using R290, which is propane. Um, I know there are different regulations around that, um, depending on what what country and continent you're in. Um, I'm hopeful that they'll also figure out how to incorporate CO2 as a refrigerant, like like we figured out for heat pump water heaters. Uh, and maybe that's the next generation of PTHPs. <laughs> um, cool. Next generation and next generation. Next. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Christy Love, do you still um, want to come on in? Yeah, there you are. Sure, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Carmel. And thanks, Vicki. Uh, I, maybe I'll ask a different question because I think my prior question was, was answered. Um, I'm working mostly on multifamily retrofits these days. And I'm curious, Vicki, if you or anyone at Stephen Winter has looked at, because they are small units and they have somewhat limited capacity, so they work well for passive house. Have you done any analysis on like what level of enclosure upgrade would be required for these to be provide um, for heating, heating demands or cooling demand? Um, say if you went to interfit levels as opposed to like new, new construction levels, um, has anyone looked at that? Um, most of the projects we looked at that were completed were new construction. Um, in terms of using this for like potential retrofits, I mean, the main benefit was that it's easy to switch out. So if there's, if that building already has poor PTACs, um, they can just easily switch it out with PTHPs. Um, but yeah, I don't think we've done quite in-depth analysis on, on retrofit projects quite yet. Yeah, and we've looked at some um, like just sort of 1970s-ish buildings here on the West Coast. And you, if you didn't do anything to the enclosure, you'd have to add a whole bunch of these units to a suite to meet the heating demand. So um, I still think they have great potential if you also upgrade the enclosure. Okay, I think we have Sandra Lester up next. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Vicki, for the presentation. It was really informative. And I was wondering about um, using this technology to retrofit buildings in Climate Zone 8. Uh, we've been working on a project in Labrador City and just wondered how things are going to perform up there. Uh, can you remind me, like, 
What, which one is climate zone eight? <laughs> it's, it's Arctic. It's like way up at the very far edge of uh, of continental Canada. So um, it's about as harsh as you can get in the Canadian environment north of the um, Arctic Circle. Gotcha. Um, yeah, we've seen, I mean, yeah, like good COP values. So good wintertime performance in general. Um, so a COP of 1.6 at negative 20 degrees Celsius and COP of three um, for the heating at like around, I think, I think 47 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so, I mean, with that, it, it generally eliminates the need for electric resistance backup heater. Um, I haven't quite worked in uh, any projects involving climate zone eight. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, sorry, I can't speak too much <laughs> about that. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if anybody in the community has modeled it, because what I'm wondering is when it switches over to be better to be on the resistance heating back up, I guess, um, rather than using the, the heat pump. Um, we're talking about minus 50 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. on the coldest days, so it's, it's a very challenging environment. Got it. Uh, what systems do they typically use? Uh, they typically use resistance heaters or um, a uh, heater using uh, heating oil. Um, at the moment, we're trying to get them off the heating oils um, and on onto electric. Um, I just don't know how the electric heat pumps are going to perform under that level of stress. Mm -hmm. Sandra or Sandra, Sandra. Yeah, Sandra. Sandra, um, are are there is there usage of um, like just your typical um, heat pump there, like you know discounting um, package thermal heat pumps? Um, but I know that in Arctic climates, um, we're starting to see some good results from um, from heat pump space heating, but um, wasn't sure what that what you're finding. Yeah, when we when we modeled it um, using an hourly energy model with Equest, um, it we didn't get a lot of efficiency out of using the heat pump. But um, I I don't know if that would be different on PHPP and using the predictive model that way. I think generally when you're talking about such low temperatures, you're you're going to get into uh, electric resistance heating mode and then you're talking about the efficiency you know the same efficiency as as um as the other systems that you just mentioned um and so you you lose the efficiency benefits of uh doing a heat pump um the question is how many hours of the year are you hitting those <laughs> those temperatures and willing to go down to a cop of one um and effectively operate uh, using only electric resistance heating. Yeah, 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 I know. I'm concerned about frosting as well, like the the frosting of the system and yeah. just getting, you know, dealing with the humidity and it condensing on the unit and having to to deal with that. It's a little bit challenging too. Yeah, I think we've had a few questions on defrost and um, whether that's kind of being improved. Um, Vicki, I don't know if that's anything that you're aware of or if we need to ask someone from a manufacturer to come on here and, and give us some intel. Yeah, maybe we can get like a lunch and learn or something with the uh, manufacturers directly. Um, yeah, I, I don't have too much information on um, their performance at even lower temperatures right now. Thanks for answering the question. Yeah, it's... it's um, yeah, it's challenging on that those northern climate situations. Um, even even uh, New York is getting, you know, colder snaps in the in the uh, the winter with the polar vortex. So um, it's something that we should all be considering with our our work and how things are performing at those very low temperatures um, for, you know, larger periods of times. Yeah. Great reminder that um, a good solution in one place could be a not so good solution in another place, <laughs> and we're working across 
many climate zones in this community. Thank you, Sandra. I think next on deck, we have David Lynn. Um, did you wanna unmute and ask, ask your question? Sure, yeah. My question is regarding the premise of this, which is the decarbonization. And I was just curious, how does electrification reduce the carbon emissions from usage of fuel? Yeah, like for just passive house buildings in general, just designing to um, be ultra low energy and cutting down the energy demand needed for heating and, and cooling and for the overall building, um, which then makes it easier to get to say net zero um, and being supported by solar uh, and other renewable sources and then being full electric with, with equipment like PTHPs and other systems. So the fuel would be from solar or geothermal or something that's not as highly carbon emitted as uh, fossil fuels, right? Yeah, right. Gotcha. And when you go to all electric, you open up the opportunity for a decarbonizing grid. So that's, that's the main goal there. Sorry, what's a decarbonizing grid? Who wants to take this one? <laughs> It's the chicken and egg situation that we have with electrification, right? Um, some areas of our countries have um, a good source of electricity, meaning a cleaner source that's not as carbon emission heavy. Um, and some areas have really bad sources like coal. Um, so it, it depends on how clean your grid is. And when we talk about electri electrifying and creating more demand for electricity at our buildings, we have to understand where that electricity is coming from in the grid. So decarbonizing the grid, making sure that that electricity comes from a clean, cleaner at least place if we're increasing the demand. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, your question was very much in line with that. Um, and, and how do we balance those decisions? Um, so to um, Ate? Atta, yeah, hey, that was pretty good. Good point to that. Yeah, Atta, thanks. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Um, well, since it seems that the envelope of the actual unit, the the uh, sleeves, seems to be such a sort of a weak point right now, while the manufacturers figure out how to do the thermal break and um, and better insulation, is it possible in the meantime for us as architect builders to add insulation to the outside of the sleeve and improve that thermal performance? Sort of just you sort of customize the penetration, basically. Yeah, I think so. I think the goal would be to insulate as much as you can around it. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, I mean, that was a short answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar with the detail of the envelope of the unit itself, but you know how one would do that. But it just seems that that's that's kind of one of the weak links on the thing right now. And uh, and are there sort of opportunities to customize it while we're waiting for manufacturers to get better at integrating it into the actual product? Hmm. Yeah, I would say trying to insulate as much as you can around it. And also if it's possible, like choosing to have a smaller penetration through the building, um, that would also reduce your thermal bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we had time for probably one, Carmel, what do you think? One question or one or two questions? Yeah, maybe we go to one more question um, and then we'll talk about what's up next. Um, the the I just wanna say the chat is going crazy and you all are really you know answering each other's questions and um, and sharing some great products and, and, um, and research. So thanks for everyone's engagement. Um, Zoe, who do we wanna put on the spot as the last question? Oh man, so much pressure on this person. Um, all right. Uh, let's go to Michael Sofford. Do you want to unmute? Do you remember your question? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I found it. I had to go back to the chat. Um, so my question was more about the softwares used to compare the options. I saw like heat three was used for three-dimensional heat transfer analysis for like the thermal bridging work. I was wondering what you used for the energy, um, 
energy energy cost analysis when you're comparing package package terminal heat pumps with centralized like air distribution systems and that's with and without energy recovery uh the cost analysis mostly looking at first cost um i didn't uh energy I could ask... energy cost yeah so like the actual uh energy performance he's including oh. demand uh and yeah i see uh in terms of the heating demand and energy demand uh we used our passive house models so um either the phpp for phi projects or woofy for fias projects okay and that's and then yeah okay i'm just wondering like how how you were trying to work out the uh energy savings between going for these like localized systems versus a centralized air distribution with like you still have local extract right and make up air units to deliver extra fresh air which is preheated with an air energy recovery device and then still have a package terminal unit in the in the apartment for like comfort cooling i was wondering if that was analyzed uh yeah i don't think we analyzed it too in depth in terms of that um we've mostly been looking at it in terms of modeling for passive house okay. um but yeah that's definitely interesting and something we could can potentially look into more in depth later. With that, um, and any final um, thoughts or words, um, Vicky, from from these questions that have arisen, or maybe some takeaways on like what's up next for research. Sorry, I wasn't sure if that was for me or for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was that was for you, Vicky, or, or maybe we get some audience input of uh, you know, uh, yeah, we need more um, testing. We need more. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, a lot of testing um, and potentially like, yeah, more than one uh, uh, round of testing for these pr products. Um, and again, it's definitely not just specific to ICER. Um, other PTHP manufacturers are also coming to us um, asking for recommendations on how to improve their air leakage numbers, um, how to make this more um, thermally efficient um so yeah someone even said in the chat we need more testing in all caps <laughs> so yeah we're definitely very excited on um seeing how improvements are continued to be made there and then also uh seeing actual performance results on our projects once they're implemented maybe some cold climate um digging in there too maybe one more question from john foster and, and a couple of people asked this as well related to the thermal bridging of the sleeve itself of the ice air john did you want to ask that question um yeah i think looking back in the chat i think uh, someone mentioned uh um some sleeving material that uh that was had a, a lower thermal bridge sounded like it's insulated and i'm not sure and sorry, I wasn't tuned in the whole time, so I missed if if anyone actually did explain that the the sleeves that I've seen have been a kind of a thin plastic, and I'm not a as a fellow swoofy type of person, so I have no idea how much um, um, heat you lose through those thin plastic sleeves that gets transmitted through the sleeve itself. So not the insulation around it, but the actual sleeve itself kind of leaking heat. Yeah, I think for these analyses, we assumed a metal sleeve um, might have com components of plastic involved. But... Yeah. Okay. And, and what that that was quite a major um, thermal bridge. I think I've heard passive house people, yeah, you know, complaining about that as being the main block. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the main disadvantage is that metal sleeve going through it. Yeah, I think there was something about, yeah, Dale Tacoma said the sleeves were, oh yeah, no reason they could not be plastic. So maybe it's a jurisdictional aspect. And someone in the chat mentioned phenolic uh, tubes of some kind, which is like an older kind of plastic that's more heat resistant. But anyway, <laughs> I guess we're all learning. Uh, okay. And it's on, yep. 
Thank you, John. It, and it sounded like Vicki, the um, insulating, the further insulating of the sleeve was helping to um, overcome the thermal bridge of just the metal sleeve. Right, yeah. Awesome. So. Um, well, I um, I think we wanna just give a quick sneak peek to what we have next for the, um, for the next gen series next month. But first wanted to give a huge thank you to Vicki um, and to everyone for joining um, this is definitely a continuing conversation. And um, next month, um, we have an, another two colleagues of Vicky's from Stephen Winter Associates that are going to be joining us speaking about passive house ventilation commissioning. So another um, uh, another MEP system side of passive house that we're, we're figuring out and learning along the way. Uh, thank you all for joining. Zoe, any, any parting words? No, just uh, this is, like you said, this um, kind of work in progress type research and um, really appreciate, you know, Vicki, you and your whole team for um, embarking on it. And there's more that we can all do. So um, looking forward to, I guess, an update at some point. Um, and yeah, looking forward to next month, um, talking about some the commissioning end of um, some HVAC systems. So thanks all for joining. Thanks for all of the information um, that you provided in the chat, all of the great details and links. So um, yeah, make sure to check out the chat at some point if you weren't able to follow it. So until next thanks. time. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks.